Hi. Um, I'd just like to check first if everyone can hear me. Could someone put their hand up at the back if you can hear me okay? Just thanks a lot. That's really helpful. Dobry uh, den, PyCon Slovakia. I am really happy to be here um, and to be speaking. I'm just super pleased that the conference is doing so well. And today I'm going to talk to you about unsafe at any speed, and I'll get on to why the talk is called that in a minute, but first I will just quickly um, introduce myself. I hope I will, yes. Um, so yeah, as Philip said, my name is Ray Nola. I'm actually British, but I live in Zurich, um, which you can see. I thought it's more interesting to put a picture of Zurich than me because you know what I look like. Um, I mostly do PHP and Python web development, and a lot of the stuff in this talk is going to be, well, it's going to be based on examples from web development, but I think a lot of it is pretty universally applicable. Um, yeah, my pronouns are they, them, there. If anyone knows what the gender neutral personal pronoun is in Slovak, come find me, because I'm always curious finding out that kind of thing. And as you can see, I work for a web development agency in Zurich called Leap. And I'm even wearing my Leap t-shirt today. Um, they gave me the budget to come out here, so I'd just like to thank them from the stage. Okay. Um, so, when I came up with this talk, I had the idea for it, and I didn't really know exactly what the details would be. And then my friend Daniele said, oh, you could call it unsafe at any speed. And I said, that's a great idea. It's so much better than the original idea, which was floating around in my brain for about two months while I was writing this talk. Um, taking a tip from Lady Gaga, caught in a bad default. I just like the sound of that. But instead, I picked unsafe at any speed. And this talk um, is, well, not directly inspired by, but I found a lot of similarities between what I wanted to talk about and this really famous book from 1965. Um, it was written by Ralph Nader, who probably most of us know best as a presidential candidate from 2000, but at the time he was really a consumer advocate. And Unsafe at Any Speed is a very angry criticism of the automobile industry in America. Um, Ralph Nader did some research and wrote this book which says the auto industry has no regard for driver safety, pedestrian safety, or passenger safety, and dangerous cars are being produced just because it's cheaper to do that way. Um, here's an example which came up in a lot of the chapters of his book. It's actually kind of a beautiful car, um, classic design. This is the Chevrolet Cor Corvair convertible, um, and I always say that wrong. Um, early 60s car, and the big innovation of the Chevrolet Corvair was that it has what's known as swing axle suspension. Um, I had to read up about this because I'm not a mechanical engineer, I'm a software engineer. So this is what that means. Basically, in, if you think of a very old-fashioned cart or car, and the axles, you probably think of one line that goes straight underneath the car and has a wheel on either end. And the swing axle is slightly different. You can see in this first picture, we're looking at the back of the car. Um, the car has two axles and they connect in the middle. And in fact, they can change their angle. And this was um, a big innovation at the time, the early 60s. And the advantage here is that if you are going along um, a rugged terrain, so there are bumps, potholes, whatever. Um, it's, it gives a nicer suspension. The left wheel can go up and over a bump, and the right wheel is theoretically not affected at all. So the car kind of, the bottom of the car adapts to the ground it's driving on. And in the second image, you can see an illustration of what happens when our car, which is moderately loaded, takes a right turn. And as you probably would expect if you kind of run this with a model car a few times to get it right in your head. That's what I had to do. Um, you can see the rightmost wheel, so the inner one to the turn, is moving on its angle. That's fine. And what you can't really see in this picture, although there is an arrow, um, 
is that the angle of the left wheel also changes. OK, that's fine. Like Our car is driving as intended. Uh, but then say we take an even sharper turn, or we're going really fast. Swing axle is actually quite a popular design on racing cars of the time, so it's not really a theoretical. Uh, the right wheel moves its angle, and the left wheel also really starts to get an extreme angle there. And if you just look at the bottom of the left um, tire, you can see it's starting to kind of push and crumple a little bit into the road. And then, of course, the fourth picture is what happens when we have a heavy car and we're going fast and the turn is too sharp. And this is what's known as tuck under. The leftmost wheel just tucks underneath the rest of the vehicle. Uh, it buckles. The car spins out of the turn. Probably, this definitely happened and people died. Probably the car takes a couple of rolls across. Um, and this is a horrible catastrophe if you're in the car. This is really bad. This is dangerous. But although Chevrolet knew that this was a problem with their cars, they didn't really lift a finger to stop it at all. They didn't do anything. They didn't tell people. They didn't like change the design. Um, what they did do was, in the car parts catalog, you could see um, an option to have an add-on, an aftermarket add-on um, for your car, um, with upgraded springs and dampers, front anti-roll bars, and rear axle rebound straps. Um, which basically means, yeah, you can fix the back swing axle to be less swingy, and then it's a lot safer. And the price of this on a new built car was about a dollar. You know, it was a matter of cents. That was the cost to Chevrolet of making this car safe. But they didn't do it because they wanted to save every cent that they could, and people died. Now, OK, this is the, the only case in my talk where people die. <laughs> I gave another talk a few years ago, or recently, um, where people also died, and it's not a major theme, but I have to... After this, it's only data that gets hurt. So, yeah. Essentially, what Chevrolet had created with the Corvair was they created a situation where the right thing to do is non-obvious. You had to be the kind of car connoisseur who knows to you know, look at all of the details in the catalog when you're buying it or you have to be connected to the network of people who discuss these improvements and say, hey, you just bought a Corvette, you really need this add-on. Most people you know, don't care that much about all of their purchases. Um, the right thing to do is not obvious, and the obvious thing to do, buy a car, drive a car, is bad. And I see a lot of cases like that in software as well. Um, not so much with, obviously, physical engineering, but with the default values that lots of libraries and tools and modules have. So what I want to do now is to give you some examples and go through why it's a problem, and then think about how they got that way. And hopefully, by the end, we can come up with some pointers on how to have good defaults in your software. My obvious disclaimer is defaults aren't bad. Bad defaults are bad. Um, you have to have default values in tools and in software, otherwise people would spend their entire work life just tweaking and adjusting and trying to figure things out and not actually using the tools for the purpose they're meant. And you, as the developer of a software tool, have spent a lot of time with it, and you kind of have a feel for what makes it performant, what makes sense for the average user. So you set it as a default, and that's fine. Bad defaults are not good. And what is a bad default? Well, in the context of this talk, I hope you can read that, in the context of this talk, I'm thinking about things where you have data loss, security breaches, or like where you become part of a botnet. Um, I'm sure we've all seen things about the, um, oh, what they, the baby monitors, which everyone can view from the web browser of your choice and Internet of Things light switches and stuff, which just get turned into botnets and DDoS the web. So that's the kind of consequence I'm thinking about here. And now I'm just going to go through some examples. Um, and I will make it personal. I want to talk about a, an example that affected me. 
it was a normal work day in December 2014, and I was just at my office um, when we got a really urgent email from a client that we'd been making a CCAM web page for. If you don't know CCAM, it's basically um, a framework for making websites to share open data. So this customer was from a government department, and we were making them a website um, like a hub for all different government open data from Switzerland. Kind of an important guy, big client. He emailed me in an absolute panic. This is basically what he had seen when he checked the website that morning. Hacked by Slayer's hack team. And that's just terrible, right? Like, hacked by Slayer's hack team, that sounds super dangerous. It's even worse than the normal kind of hacking, whatever that is. You know, he didn't know. He wasn't a developer, but this is bad. So we sprang into action to figure out what happened. And the question that you're probably all thinking is, um, had my client been hacked? No, he hadn't. Absolutely nothing had, um, had been penetrated in the database or the system. Um, someone had gone onto the website and added a new data set and a new organization. Uh, <laughs> and the data set and the organization name were Hacks by Slayer's Hack Team. But the fix for this, like the immediate fix, was to go in on the admin panel, delete the org, and delete the data. Um, but still, it's kind of weird that this was a thing that could just happen overnight. And, oh, I skipped ahead, sorry. And a little bit of Googling and looking on the CCAN mailing list, I found out that we weren't the only ones it happened to. Someone probably sitting in their bedroom at home, um, entertaining themselves one evening, had just gone around, found all of the CCAN instances that they could, and uploaded this data. Um, and this was because of the default settings in the CCAN framework at that time. Um, there were options in the config to allow anyone to make an organization and to allow anyone to upload data. And both of those were just set by, by default to true. Um, this, I don't know if that's readable at the back. I hope so. You don't have to read the whole thing. Um, there was a discussion on the GitHub repo and this is from one of the core developers, uh, David Reed, who basically explains the, the problem at the root of this. When CCAM was first started, the expectation was that users would want to make Wikipedia-like sites where anyone could become a me member of an organization, anyone could upload stuff, like completely free, open, awesome. But it turned out after a few years that almost nobody really wanted to do it that way. Certainly my client didn't because he wanted a hub for government data on set topics. Um, and so as the expectations of the users changed and the way the tool was used changed, the appropriate default had also changed. And they did, in fact, set this and some other security things more, um, more securely because the situation was different now. I keep skipping too fast. I'm sorry. Um, right, so that was actually kind of a small, a small thing. It affected me, my team, some other CCAN teams, but the damage was very small. This, on the other hand, is a very big number. There are, well, there were in 2015 when this analysis was done, 595.2 terabytes of data exposed openly on the internet via publicly accessible MongoDB databases with no authentication. Um, I'm just, after the talk, I'll put all of my slides up online and they will have clickable links so you don't have to worry about writing this all down. Um, but yeah, this is from the Shodan blog and um, yeah, it's probably most of you have heard of this. Um, Mongo, um, oh yeah, and just in case you thought this was a solved problem because you've heard of it several years ago, oh, MongoDB has insecure defaults. Um, well, this slide is from September of 2017, so really just six months ago, um, when they were posting on the MongoDB blog about a fresh wave of ransomware demands, people getting into these publicly accessible MongoDB databases, and um, 
either deleting all of the data or holding it to ransom, sort of, and saying, oh, you have to give us all your Bitcoin, otherwise you will never see your data again. So it's a really an ongoing thing. Um, yeah, and so the question is exactly what's going on here. Um, there were two problems with the old uh, defaults for security on MongoDB. Um, one was there was no authentication required, and one was that by default, your data space was open to connections from any IP. So not just your app could get in there, but anyone who had the IP. Um, and over the last years, we've seen um, a, lot of, a, a lot of attacks through this vector. Um, now, localhost only binding, so only localhost can talk to your database, um, was, became the default in the packaged release 2.6.0, so April 2014. Um, but it was only implemented in MongoDB server itself um, from 3.6, um, which I think actually has been released now. I'm suddenly not sure about that. Um, yeah, so now if you go to the Mongo website, install the software, set up a fresh project, you will have the secure defaults. Um, but the problem is lots of people are running MongoDB databases and apps built on them who won't have the capability or the, yeah, or, or know that they should do this. People who had a website set up for them in May 2014 or something, or 2013, um, by web developers who then just went on to the next project or left the company or whatever. Um, so, sorry, do I have one more slide? Yes, okay. I have this speaker notes thing, but the, um, the picture of the next slide is one centimeter tall. And this seems to be the default. Thank you, Google <laughs> Slides. So sometimes I'm not quite sure where I am here. Anyway, so MongoDB. Um, and the question is really, why, why was this the default for so long? Um, why was it only made, um, made more secure by default in more recent release releases? And my feeling is that it's because when you set up a project, the first thing you have to do is get in there, update all of the config, go into like server settings and stuff, and then eventually you can go and play with your new project. It makes it, the developer experience is a lot less fun. Um, and I feel that Mongo probably wanted to make something where you could just download it, bring it up, and immediately start talking to the database, start getting it integrated with your app. So the developer experience was really great, but people are lazy or actually really people forget um, a lot of things that they should do. And yeah, you have to consider that a lot of people do deploy software in, um, in debug mode or in de development mode. Um, even if, you, even if you think, well, surely no one would do that. Obviously, you know, when you're going into production, you have to set up non-localhost uh, only binding and so on. Um, but yeah, you, there are lots of people who will forget this, and there are lots of people who won't be able to fix it once someone else has done it the wrong way for them. Okay, that's MongoDB. And just um, as a side note, this kind of um, insecure access default has come up in a lot of different projects. Um, if you search for Hadoop or Redis, you'll find a lot of issues like this where people have again lost data. Um, the memcrashed DDoS exploit that hit GitHub a few weeks ago is also an example here. Um, by default, memcached allows um, UDP support and also allows um, listening or getting info in from any address, not just localhost. And there's a really good Cloudflare blog there about how to um, prevent that. And Elasticsearch, this one I'm definitely going to give you a link to because this one is weird. This one, you think they did everything right, but then, oh, then there's an exploit. Um, yeah. Okay, so we talked about MongoDB, we talked about UDP, um, memcached and so on, and you think, okay, well, yeah, but still, 
everybody knows that they did it wrong. So bringing it a bit more close to home to us as Pythonistas, I really like this quote. It's from a PEP, PEP476, from a few years ago. The S in HTTPS stands for secure, as everybody knows. Um, and PEP476, which I actually recommend reading just as text, it's really well put together, a really nice piece of technical writing, in fact, um, discusses the fact that up until um, a few years ago, 2014, when, um, when this was published, if you used any of the standard lib HTTP modules in Python and you tried to make an HTTPS, so secure <laughs> connection, um, it actually wasn't secure. The, um, the standard library modules did not verify that um, certificates were signed by a certificate authority um, in like any trust, trust route. So they would accept self-signed ones, which is sometimes okay, sometimes a problem. And it also didn't check that the common name on the presented certificate matched the host. So that's like me going up um, and saying to the people on the desk here, hi, I have this ticket in the name of Harold Smith. And they look at me and say, oh yes, come in. Obviously you're Harold Smith. <laughs> this means that technically, if you were writing Python code for the web and you were using any of the standard library HTTP modules, you were vulnerable to a man in the middle attack. And you probably didn't know it. In fact, I'm almost sure you didn't know it because HTTPS, secure. The word is right there in the name. Um, now, I actually do not know the exact reason why this weird security hole uh, persisted so long. Um, and if anyone like, happens to be a Python core developer who was thinking about this in 2014, I would love to talk to you about it. Um, but yeah, the effect was that most people just used requests. I mean, I use requests and I prefer it to the standard library, but sometimes you can't use external modules. Um, and were really surprised when they found out what had been going on. And so, um, yep, in 2014, the PEP was accepted. And um, now, if you're using standard lib modules, you should be safe. Um, OK, this is a really quick one, but I think it's really fun, fun slash terrifying. Um, and it's a quick example because I basically stole this from another talk, stole, um, by Tom Eastman. Um, it's called Serialization Formats Are Not Toys, and I really recommend you to watch it or read the blog post because it's great. Did you know that uh, YAML supports embedding scripting codes in values? Because I didn't until recently. Um, and one example that Tom gave for this, like when you won't use it, like, oh, you can include a date time object instead of just having a string with a date in it. Um, and then when you pass this YAML and you actually use it in your code, you have the date time object right there. It's really convenient. However, this is also really convenient. If you, if you um, run code uh, to pass YAML that contains this, um, when it looks in goodbye, it will, um, um, it will instantiate this object and it will remove everything in your drive, in your drive, in your folder. Um, so here we have a problem, as you can tell. Um, and well, I mean, that's not a problem if you know what you're doing. If you are accepting YAML and you know it's going to have code objects in it and you know you want to run that code, that's great, more power to you. Um, but if you're just accepting YAML, based, especially based on user input, um, and you're using the PyYAML library, which is the most popular Py YAML library, um, and if you just do YAML load, then you could have a nasty surprise. Um, and the issue here um, is actually really connected to documentation, I think. Um, hopefully, some of you were in Mikey's great talks this morning about documentation. Um, the tutorial does for the library does tell you um, don't use load, use safe load for any untrusted data, like anything you get from 
uh, user of your app or your website. But then I have two questions. One is, why does load exist? Oh, why is it the, de the default? Why is it called that and not like dangerous load, for example? And the other is, do the people who wrote the documentation really think that everyone who starts using this library is going to first go through the tutorial? Um, I mean, I happened to when I first used this library, just because it's the kind of person I am. Um, but if, for example, you're using example code um, or legacy code, you probably just, oh, right, yeah, we use that, okay. Or if you're relying on completion in your IDE, which I think a lot of us do, and it's really useful. It's like, I want to load, there's a function called load. Then you just use load. And you also have the issue that the JSON library for Python has load as its default load um, function. And so, yeah, you expect YAML works the same. So there's, there's a debate. Actually, if you go to the website that I just posted here, it's a GitHub issue on the PyYAML repo. And there's several years worth of discussion back and forth. Should we rename the functions? Should we make safe load, the functionality of safe load, the default? And this actually recently got accepted last year. Um, a merge request was made and accepted, but it hasn't been released, and I just can't figure out why. The last PyAML release that I can find on PyPy was from 2016. <coughs> so, yeah, this is an example of what I would say is a dangerous default. Does anyone in this room work for MongoDB? I don't see any hands going up. If you're... <laughs> okay. So, but not for Mongo. Okay, good. Then if you're here but you don't want to raise your hand, I really want to apologize to you. Uh, this is another MongoDB example. It's um, another example of a problem that, with the defaults that they fixed. So, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying, like, don't use it. Use it if you want. But these are issues that Mongo has had. And one example is that it used to have a tendency to be forgetful. Um, so, um, fire and forgetful. Basically, when you have a database, you also have data, and you want to write the data into your database. That's kind of what it's for. Um, and Mongo, which is known to be highly performant, um, used to have as its default operation um, for, in fact, all write operations, a fire and forget um, method, I guess you would say. Um, so when you're writing to your database, you would just write and write and write and write. And the program, uh, the database software, would not wait for um, a confirmation that um, that the data had been correct, correctly written. Um, and this is fine generally. Like, you can trust that generally a database software will write, because that's what it's for. And if you don't waste the extra time, which could be, you know, not, not appreciable for a human, but for a computer certainly, then um, you, make, you write a lot faster. And this is brilliant until your disk gets full. And then your program is writing and writing and writing and writing, and the data is just kind of going away. And lots of people, again, really did lose data like this. Um, so it's great performance so long as you know what you're performing to. Um, this was fixed in 2.6 um, with a performance cost. So now the default behavior of MongoDB is to write, check that, it's, that the data is there, write, check, write, check. And it's a lot safer, but it's also a lot slower. You can still use the old fire and forget methods if you're sure that's what you want to do, but you have to use a, a method that's not marked as the default. I cannot read what's on my next slide at all. <laughs> yes, okay. So 
Okay, that was our last example. Um, we went through a few different ways that what I would call bad defaults can, can come about. Um, and now just to, to summarize, obviously we, we want to write software with good default values and good everything. Um, but I think it's important to think about why the mistakes happen. And so I just want to summarize um, a few patterns that I saw um, when I was researching this. Uh, one is that the developer knows the tool, which obviously the developer does, I mean, they should. Um, but a lot of the time, they are really aware of, um, of problems in the tool. Um, I've definitely seen, like, you know how many more bugs you notice when someone else looks at your code than when you look at your own code or when you test your software? Um, because you kind of know, oh, right, if I press this button and then enter data and then look in this drop down, it will be wonky. So you just don't do that. Your brain kind of, without even telling you about it, just steers you away from the pitfalls, um, which someone else might go charging straight into. So yeah, as with a lot of things, if you know your software and your product really well, you probably can't even see the problems that are there for other people. Um, then another is unconsidered use cases, and I think this is where the CCAN issue falls, um, or yeah, along with other things, that um, they had one use case in mind for the software when they started to make it, and along the way, the kind of people who were actually using it changed. Um, then there are two which we sort of highlighted with the Mongo stuff, and they go together. Um, one is the desire to make your tool seem easy, and one is the desire to make your tool seem fast. And these are both kind of, I guess, marketing issues. You want people to use it, so you say, you know, you can just jump in there. Or, you know, you can just, it's lightning fast. It just goes like zoom. Um, and a lot of the time, there's kind of a caveat to this, which is it is fast, but if you want to use it the, the safe way, it's a lot less fast, um, or it's a lot less easy. Um, and this, I think, is another area where our brains kind of trick us, because you know your stuff is great. You know everyone would like it if they used it, and you just have to convince them to use it. Um, but yeah, marketing can be dangerous that way. And then there's another couple of things, internal tools becoming external. Um, this I've seen in a lot of places when something that you cooked up for your team, um, you release it open source because you might as well and people probably will use it. And then, yeah, it's being used by a bunch of folk who have completely different ideas for it and different expectations. And then finally, when improved methods are added later. So this may be what happened in the PyYAML case um, they had the load method, now they have the safe load method, but the namespace is already taken up with the initial method. Um, so you just kind of have to make it safe load or like XYZ load. Um, and I'm going to read you this because I think it's really important. Um, when I talk about these bad defaults and all of the harm that they've caused, I really don't want to be... Um, directly attacking the developers. Because software is hard, we all know that, and a lot of the time, when you go into things, your, your own attitudes change and your own knowledge changes over working at it. We're all trying our best. This is from um, a paper called Insecure by Default um, by Lee and Evans, two researchers who looked into security issues in um, the five, I think five or seven, biggest popular web, web frameworks. And in their summary, they say, we expect that most of the insecure aspects of current web frameworks are not due to ignorance or carelessness on the parts of their designers, but difficult trade-offs between security, functionality, usability, and ease of development. So, you know, we're all doing our best, even people who massively me mess up sometimes. Um, and yeah, like I probably should have checked the config for that website I set up for my client. Um, but I didn't, I missed that. Okay, but we want to do better. And how shall we do that? Since we all write Python, 
I would think that we should take some inspiration from the Zen of Python. And here are two of the, uh, of the lines in that that I think are particularly um, valuable. One is explicit is best than implicit. And the second one is, was in fact cited in the PEP 476 by the writer Alex Gaynor. Um, Errors should never pass silently. And this is what Alex Gaynor was concerned about with the insecure HTTPS connections. Um, and when making the PEP, he said, OK, well, fallout from this could be that some people's code that was relying on the supposedly secure connections being insecure, um, like certificates were bad, but people didn't really want to, uh, didn't know that or didn't want to care about it, um, their code might fail. Um, insecure connections might break because suddenly we can't really connect to them. Um, but these, these things were already broken. It's just we didn't know about it. And that, I think, is a major pitfall to avoid. So, yeah, keeping these two ideas especially in mind, um, I think these are some useful principles for making software that has good default. Um, you need to default to security. Make it secure by default, even if that means that the developer has a couple more steps to take when they're setting it up. You need to make it reliable in favor of performance. You can add the performance options there, definitely, um, but make the, don't make them the defaults. Just say, hey, if you know the risks and you want to go faster, you can set it to this. Um, but that shouldn't be how it is to begin with. Never swallow errors. And if it's a serious error, um, hard fail. Don't be afraid to. If it's better that the program crashes out rather than carrying on in this um, errored state, then just crash out. Um, so for example, if you're writing to a database, the database is full, don't just kind of throw an error and log it and let yourself keep writing. Um, if there's no safe default, you have to put in a step that demands explicit configuration before you can continue developing. Um, I mean, obviously, what's safe is depends on your particular scenario. But yeah, make the developer aware and make them take the steps, which probably won't be too severe, I'm sure. And finally, if a bad default does happen, be brave enough to fix it. In just about all of these cases, eventually, the designers and the developers stepped up and said, OK, we have heard from people who have who've had trouble with this. We accept that this was a condition we hadn't really thought of when we were originally designing the software. But this is obviously how people are using it in the field. And our defaults are causing problems. So um, yeah, we have to fix it in future um, iterations. Yeah, be brave enough to do that. People will accept it. <laughs> Um, yeah, and that's the end of my talk for now. I think I have some time for questions. Sure, we have uh, no. one minute for for questions, so we we'll try to okay, uh, at least Let's answer go. the first question. Any suggestions for making your defaults more visible, explicit, so we always keep them in mind? Perhaps by writing tests relying on implicit defaults. Oh, yeah, I think tests relying on, on the defaults um, is a good idea. Um, yeah, that's nice. I like that. Uh, another is kind of related to what I said at the end of my final slide. Um, force the developer to, to pick defaults, or at least accept the ones that you've put um, before they use it. I saw something, again, in Mikey's talk this morning, where um, I think it was in Minishift, there's um, a warning that flashes up when you try to use a particular configuration that says, this, is, this can cause your VM to lock up. If you use it, you may regret it. Um, but you can use it if <laughs> we can't stop you using it. Um, and I think a lot of the time, like when you set up, for example, um, a MySQL database on the command line, you go through a thing where you have to click through, like, oh, what? URL will you um, address it as, what's your password, and so on. Um, and also when you're setting up a Django website. So I think that's useful. <laughs>